The federal government's plan to impose a $170 per ton carbon tax in place nationally by the year 2030 will result in 30,000 fewer jobs here in Alberta. Now that's according to a new study released by the Fraser Institute. Joining me now to talk about it from Guelph, Ontario, is the co-author of the study, Dr. Ross McKittrick, a professor of economics at the University of Guelph and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Dr. Ross, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thanks, good afternoon. Now, the federal government has said the higher carbon tax will have almost zero impact on the economy, but your study suggests otherwise and will, in fact, have a major impact on employees across the country, including here in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was never credible of the government to say a tax of this magnitude would have no effect on the economy. I don't know why they would say that, but they've also not released any analysis of it. So if they have some magic model that gives them that result, then they should release the details. But uh, otherwise, I think it just represents wishful thinking on their part. The analysis that we did at the Fraser Institute uses a very conventional uh, macroeconomic modeling framework. And one of the points that I made in the report was that when we look at all the modeling work that was done by the government for the Kyoto Protocol about 20 years ago, for similar size emission reductions, we're just getting roughly the same numbers that they were getting back then, including the employment impacts. So um, I think that their claim that their plan would have no impact on the economy was never credible. And I think the numbers that we've published here are a lot more realistic. Now, you estimate a 1.8% decline in gross domestic product. How did you actually come up with that number? The model that we used, uh, it's a uh, called a national computable general equilibrium model. The, the title doesn't really matter too much, but like I say, this is a standard macroeconomic modeling tool similar to ones that have been used inside the government and in the private sector. It traces the way um, cost increases, like a, in this case a carbon tax, affect markets across the country. The price increases cause people to adjust their buying patterns. They buy less of some things, they'll substitute into other things. Businesses respond, including by reducing hiring in some areas. And then in this particular type of model, um, we don't look at the transition stage where people are put out of work uh, and so you have a surge of unemployment at first. We're looking at the, um, the stage after the adjustment where the people who've been put out of work in one sector as much as possible are re-employed in other sectors, including sectors that might expand because of the, the rebate payments and things like that. So the job losses are net of the gains that the government is pointing to from the rebates and the new spending that they're proposing. So Dr. Ross, when the government says, don't worry about it, this will have zero impact on the economy, what do you think they're really basing that on? Well, I wish they would tell us. I wish they would release the analyses that supports that claim. I don't find it credible. And it's a big difference from the case 20 years ago, around the time of the Kyoto Protocol. They had multiple teams working on the modeling and the economic analysis, and they put out a lot of information so that we could see for ourselves um, what the numbers look like. And those analyses were influential on the government. They actually backed away from their plans to aggressively try to achieve the Kyoto targets because they could see the costs. This time, what we have is the government saying, it's not gonna cost anything, but we're not releasing any analyses to back that claim up. So um, it's a good question. You, you've asked exactly the right question. What are they basing it on? I know that they have people inside the government who can do this kind of analysis but I'm afraid that um, either they've done the analysis, they didn't like the numbers, or they haven't actually done it. And um, either way, I don't think it's fair to Canadians. I think that they should um, do what they did last time, have multiple teams within the government work on this, put out a range of, of uh, studies, and let's, uh, let's all see the numbers together. I was chatting with Dan McTagg, former Liberal MP and President for Canadians for Affordable Energy, and he says this carbon tax is really an attack on humanity, especially with the Liberals saying they want to, go, want to go to net zero emissions by the year 2050. Now, Dr. Ross, one of the arguments used by supporters of the carbon tax is that Canadian workers will be okay because of the carbon tax rebate. How would you respond to that? 
Well, uh, it certainly helps cushion the blow. Uh, here again, though, the government is is saying um, they're putting up promotional statements saying that most Canadians will be made better off by the whole tax uh, package. Uh, I think there's a few deficiencies with that. Um, first of all, we found in our analysis that in every province, uh, average per capita household consumption goes down. So on average, um, people are worse off. And um, even with the rebates, people are still spending more uh, through the carbon tax than they're getting. But another part of the problem here, and I haven't heard the government address this at all, is because the economy shrinks as a whole, um, other levels of government, both the federal and the provincial governments, are getting less in tax revenue on the rest of the economy. The income tax base will shrink, uh, the sales tax base shrinks, and so they have a hole in their revenue that they have to make up. And they're either going to uh, have to cut spending or increase taxes somewhere. And so they need to take account of how that's going to impact households as well. And I haven't heard a good explanation from them about how they're going to deal with that. So again, I think um, their claim that everybody or most people end up better off because yes, you're paying a pretty high carbon tax, but you're getting rebates. Um, I don't think that holds up on close inspection. Now, we tend to think of the carbon tax affecting the price of fuel and our home heating as well. But what about other areas this will have an immediate impact on when it comes to our cost of living? Well, uh, with an economy like Canada's, everything that uses energy is now going to have to go up in price because the producers of those goods and services, they're now paying more as well. So transportation, um, anything that uses motor vehicles, trucking, uh, for instance, but also agriculture. Um, farmers, of course, are, are big consumers of fuel for um, the um, operations of a farm. So their outputs become more expensive. Um, so it isn't just the cost of gasoline. It's all the indirect price effects that work their way through everything uh, that we uh, buy and sell. Um, those cost impacts um, especially in the, the area of transportation intensive um, goods and services. Canada is a big country. We have long distances to travel. Um, out in the Maritimes, for instance, a lot of things have to come long distances to get there. Um, but also on the prairies, as you know, um, you, you have long distances to cover. And so that factors into Canadian cost of living, uh, just the transportation budget. You know what exactly I'm thinking as well of uh, jet fuel you know, and hopping on an airplane to go visit my kids out in southern Ontario, it'll cost me more as well because Air Canada or WestJet, they're going to pass the increased cost on to me, the consumer, right? So, yeah, it'll impact so many well, different it's, people. It's the whole logic of, of the policy, and it, it, it makes sense from an economic point of view. If you want people to use less fuel, you'll have to charge more and get them to cut back. But it does mean that people are paying more. So the policy wouldn't work if you didn't make fuel more expensive. Right. Now, as far as fighting climate change goes, to what degree will the carbon tax affect emissions? How effective will it really be? Right now, um, that's the, the, big, uh, the big unanswered question. The, the problem with things like heating fuels, uh, transportation fuels, um, the demand for those kinds of, of energy, it's what we call inelastic. It means it's not very responsive to price. That's why taxes are high to begin with on gasoline. It's a good thing to tax because you can put a tax on it and people still have to use it. Um, for the government, if it wants to raise revenue, you don't put a big tax on something that people will stop using as soon as you put the tax on. So we've long known that gasoline, for instance, um, is not very responsive to price changes, at least um, in the short run. And um, so um, in order to get emissions down a long way, you have to increase the tax quite high. And um, so the, um, uh, the big question is, will they succeed in getting emissions down if people just keep using the fuels and are willing to pay more? Um, we'll have to wait and see. But the calculations that we did are they will get part of the way to the Paris targets, but they still are going to need to uh, um, uh, increase the tax even higher if they want to hit the Paris target. Business owners have been hit very, very hard during the pandemic, especially with the lockdowns and the restrictions. 
Uh, there was a report from Restaurants Canada, more than 10,000 restaurants have gone under so far across the country. Now let's talk about a carbon tax on top of the restrictions and the lockdowns. What kind of an impact will the carbon tax have on a lot of business owners? Well, I think you can um, pretty much predict that it's, uh, it's a burden on top of the very tough circumstances that they're in. Um, the um, restaurant, hotels, the, the whole travel sector, um, but also a lot of stores. Um, right now, they are looking at just trying to stay alive long enough to have a chance to recover when um, eventually, hopefully, the, the pandemic passes. Um, we're, um, uh, as I'm sure you and your viewers all know, it's taking a lot longer than we had hoped. And um, that means we are looking at at least another year of um, very tough circumstances, especially for restaurants. Now, restaurants are big users of natural gas, and um, they're also purchasers of food inputs that will be affected by this. Um, so I, I am a bit concerned that uh, the nature of the carbon tax is that it, it does involve a fairly large percentage price increase for natural gas over the, the whole implementation period. Now, Dr. Ross, do you have any thoughts on Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's newly released climate plan that includes a $20 per tonne carbon charge on fuel? Will this be effective, or is it even actually a carbon tax? Um, I think calling it a charge rather than a tax is just semantics. Um, I would say, from, from my perspective, $20 is a much better... Um, price than 170 in terms of being a lot closer to the kinds of estimates of what the appropriate carbon tax is, um, what we call the social cost of carbon. Um, however, it's not going to have a big effect on emissions. Uh, one of my concerns with the conservative approach to this is I think they recognize that this is not a good time to impose um, really costly measures on the economy and, and these are not policies that have a very strong motivation behind them and yet at the same time they're saying they're going to achieve the Paris targets just as fast or even faster than the Liberals. I don't think they can square those two halves of or they can't reconcile those two halves of their position. Um, I think um, even with the Liberals, I mean, they they don't have a plan to achieve the Paris targets. They have a plan for uh, carbon tax and other regulatory measures, but I don't think anyone really believes that they're going to get all the way to the Paris targets with what they've announced. And with the Conservatives, the gap is even larger. And I just wish that some of these federal parties would just be up front with Canadians and say, we made this promise back at the Paris meeting, but we didn't really know what we were promising. And it turns out it's not a realistic target for us. So rather than crush the economy at a, a time like this, why don't we just um, step back a bit and ask what's a reasonable target for us to take on, given we're such a small player, especially on, on the, the uh, global stage. Um, let's talk about what's a reasonable target and do that rather than try to achieve an arbitrary and largely meaningless policy that was made without any analysis. How about the Biden administration, now that they're in power here with the Democrats in the United States, are they also trying to meet these Paris targets? Well, they said that they're going to rejoin uh, the Paris Accord and uh, meet their targets. Ironically, the United States has reduced its emissions quite a bit more than Canada has, but that's partly because they had a large fleet of coal-fired power plants that when they retired, they were switched over to natural gas. But they have the same challenge as we do, long geographical distances, a growing population. I mean, that's more than anything for Canada. That's the driver of our increased emissions. We have a rapidly growing population, and the government wants the population to keep growing. It's the same in the United States. They're population is growing and um, so that means more people driving more people using fuels and um, so the biden administration i think they they see this as a chance to do a bit of what i would call virtue signaling on the world stage they're going to rejoin the paris target but it's unlikely they're going to put a package of policies that gets through congress that um, would actually get them uh, the kinds of emission reductions that are required
Dr. Ross McKittrick, Professor of Economics at the University of Guelph, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure.